Okay. Okay, welcome everyone. Um, this presentation is about building soil, how responsible soil preparation augments good gardening. Um, and just to start off with, uh, as I was making this presentation, I realized that there's quite a bit of terminology that uh, uh, most of you are probably familiar with, but um, may be a little unknown. So. First, I'm just gonna go over the presentation outline. Uh, terminology is one of the first things I'll be talking about. Then we'll go to the basics of soil health, why it's important to have healthy soil before you start planting uh, seeds and starts and that, that sort of thing. Uh, then we'll go into cover crops, uh, types, different types of cover crops, winter mulching, crop rotation, and then uh, finally compost. And at the end, I'll kind of highlight uh, three key takeaways um, that should be useful in your gardening practice. So first of all, just have some simple definitions. Um, and by the way, these are not Merriam-Webster definitions. They are um, just kind of definitions that I've learned uh, from attending workshops through the Purdue Extension, um, going to different uh, urban farms around Indianapolis uh, and, and just, um, different um, uh, terms I've learned, learned from, from uh, urban farmers. So uh, soil, the way it's been defined to me is a growing medium that has a lot of organic material. Uh, dirt is still a growing medium, but it, it lacks a lot of that organic matter, those nutrients. Um, germination, uh, it's, it's when a seed sprouts. Um, so a lot of people just say, oh, that sprouted. Well, germination, that's the, uh, the scientific term, the professional term. Heaving is when the soil moves rapidly due to temperature change, usually. Um, so if, for instance, Indiana is kind of well known for this, uh, you know, it can be in the upper 30s in the morning and then by the late afternoon, it's, you know, maybe 65. Um, so that kind of, temperature swing really uh, does number on soil. Um, and some of the um, methods we'll be talking about uh, mitigate that effect. Uh, they may not stop it completely, but uh, things like cover crops, um, crop rotation, they, they definitely help um, with that. So dormancy is when uh, plants go into kind of a hibernation. Um, they uh, uh, basically go to sleep, hibernate like a bear would. Um, and then in the spring, they'll, they'll reappear. They'll uh, already, some of them will already be along in their, in their growth uh, period. So they, you're not starting from scratch like you would from um, other seeds. Uh, SWCD is just an abbreviation for Soil and Water Conservation District. A lot of the information that I'm going to be discussing in this presentation, uh, I've learned through the Marion County Soil and Water Conservation District. Um, and generally speaking, there's an SWCD in I think most counties and most states, at least Indiana, as far as I understand. Um, green mulch um, is a uh, it's kind of slang for cover crop that has reached uh, an appropriate level of growth. So when the cover crop has reached that level of growth, it can then be bent, pushed down, and then planted into. Um, if you've planted it in rows, this is especially um, helpful. So um, we'll be talking about that a little bit. And then a broad fork is just a pitchfork, uh, like you would see on a farm. Um, you know, it's just a little bit wider. It's about, I would say, if you put two or three pitchforks side by side, uh, you would have about the width of a broad fork. So I'm not sure if this video will play. I don't think it will. Um, but essentially what I'm doing in this video uh, is 
moving soil back and forth. So I'm standing on top of the broad fork, the base of it above the uh, teeth is wide enough to where you can stand on it and you can kind of pull back. And you want to do that from the, oh, there it goes. It's sideways, but. <laughs> so hopefully everyone can see this. Um, but yeah, basically you're just uh, kind of moving it backwards, stepping back. Um, you don't want to do it the other way um, because then you're just walking over what you've uh, broad forked. And the reason being for doing this is that uh, you want to agitate the soil just enough so that roots can grow. And especially in Indiana, we have a lot of clay in some places. So it's, uh, it's helpful to um, break that soil up enough to where the roots don't have to work quite so hard to, to grow. Um, this is really important for potatoes, um, carrots, I suppose it would be helpful for um, maybe kohlrabi, um, beets, uh, radishes, things like that. Um, so it's definitely, it's kind of an expensive tool. Um, it's definitely more expensive than, a, you can do the same thing with a broad fork. It just takes more, or excuse me, a regular pitch fork. Uh, it just takes more time. Um, so yeah, moving on uh, to the basics of soil health. Soil health is determined by a number of factors. Um, the three I'm going to be discussing in this presentation are, as I said, cover crops, uh, crop rotation, and composting. Um, so why, why is soil health important? Um, uh, soil, uh, as, I, as I talked about, has a lot of organic matter, whereas dirt um, has much less organic matter. Uh, this is important because uh, crops, um, any, any kind of vegetable or fruit you plant, um, herbs not quite so much, but still uh, need nutrients. And the more organic matter you have in your soil, uh, the more, the higher nutrient density you're probably going to have. Um, so uh, it's, it's, it's very, um, it's very important that, you know, your soil kind of has, um, from what I've seen, it's usually a darker color, kind of uh, usually black um, rather than gray or like a light brown. Um, it's usually moist um, and has a, a good consistency. Um, at a lot of uh, Marion County Soil and Water Conservation District um, workshops, they'll, they'll often do a demonstration where they have just kind of plain old dirt and uh, really healthy soil and they'll set them in two different um, beakers uh, with a grate underneath. They'll pour water over both of them. And with the dirt, uh, it just, you know, falls right through. It turns into mud, doesn't hold any water. With the soil, it actually holds quite a bit of water. And so that's, that's kind of the consistency you're looking for. Um, Marion County SWCD has a soil health initiative. Um, they will, uh, as far as I understand, come to anyone's property within Marion County, uh, do a soil test, kind of check the consistency of your soil. Um, that's part of the soil health initiative. Uh, so that's, that's a very helpful um, initiative that is accessible to anyone in Marion County. And I believe other SWCDs have similar programs. Um, the Purdue Extension uh, usually holds uh, gardening workshops. I attended several of these last year, um, and they go over uh, similar topics on soil health, um, growing different kinds of fruits and vegetables, protecting against pests, uh, a lot of different stuff. Um, I found them incredibly helpful. Um, and some of what I'm talking about here has uh, definitely come from those workshops. Um, so here I just kind of have like a very quick quiz. Uh, you don't have to answer out loud, but I was just wondering if, if you all could tell the difference between um, which one is soil and which one is dirt. Um, and if you think the one, I believe it's on my right, uh, maybe on your left, the one that has a darker coloring, if you thought that was soil, you're correct. And so now I'm going to talk a little bit about cover crops. Um, 
There are many different kinds of cover crops. Uh, they include peas, oats, crimson clover, uh, buckwheat, rye, sorghum, sedan grass, hairy vetch, <laughs> and many more. I wrote them down. That's why I'm looking down because there's there's a ton. Um, and they all improve your soil, uh, but they go about doing it in different ways. Um, one of the most common cover crop mixes is oats and peas. And the benefit to that mix is that the oats grow uh, usually a little bit quicker than the peas. And so that gives the peas, um, the peas are a climbing vine, that gives the peas structure to climb on. Uh, so it's kind of a, a symbiosis between the oats and the peas. Uh, the peas will, uh, green peas will set uh, nitrogen in the soil in these little nodes. Um, and they're very small. They're um, about the size of a green pea. Um, so that helps with your nutrient levels in your soil. Uh, the oats give support to the peas uh, to climb and grow up on. The oats also uh, stabilize your soil. Not quite as much as some other, other co cover crops like uh, rye um, or sorghum sudan grass, but they, they still uh, help out quite a bit with that. Um, and so here I, I just, I kind of talk about um, the cover crops I've had the most experience with. Um, we planted all of these uh, in the campus gardens um, in different areas last November, so November 2019. Um, we mostly planted rye, and the reason for that is, um, number one, it tolerates uh, frost and sub-zero temperatures. It's, um, so it's very hardy. Uh, it helps stabilize soil, and so you're really getting a lot of benefits. As soon as the, the temperature, I, I think I started noticing growth, even like in the upper 40s, uh, 40 degrees Fahrenheit uh, or above, I, I noticed the rye kind of making a little bit of movement. So it grows uh, quite quickly once winter ends, uh, you know, middle of spring, uh, end of spring, it definitely starts taking off. Um, and rye is good to plant in. Um, I, I, uh, this is actually a picture of the uh, Marion County SWCD mayor's garden plot, this uh, top picture here. Um, and that's, I believe that's rye. Um, I just took it last week and it's, um, it's, you know, I would imagine if I went back today and I may very well go back today, it's grown even, even more since then. Um, so we haven't had a ton of really warm days uh, yet, uh, but already it's, it's taking off. Um, and when you, when you bend down that, that cover crop, um, so that it's, it's flush with the soil, you're, you're protecting, protecting the, whatever you plant into it, uh, from weeds. Um, and as long as you've spaced it appropriately far enough apart and kind of rows, this is not in, in a row. It's more of in a cluster. Um, but if you plant the rye and rows far enough apart, you can actually plant into it, uh, things like broccoli, um, really anything. Um, and the cover crop shouldn't outcompete the vegetables for root space. Um, oats and peas, as I said, uh, peas store nitrogen, oats provide support. Uh, that seems to be one of the cheapest cover crop mixes. Um, if you buy an individual cover crop on its own, it's usually not too expensive, but as far as mixes go, oats and peas seem to be uh, fairly inexpensive. Uh, and then buckwheat, um, I learned a little, a little bit about. We, we planted a little bit of buckwheat uh, last fall, uh, actually around in September, late August, no, yeah, early September, uh, we planted some buckwheat, um, and it grew somewhat, um, but it really, I think it really needs to be planted a little bit earlier, uh, definitely than rye, um, in order to get good growth. Um, it grows well in acidic soils, so soils that, uh, that are more like dirt, uh, that aren't quite so healthy, um, it, it could be a good cover crop to start with for those kinds of soils. Um, winter mulching, um, I've kind of alluded to it in the, in the previous slide. Um, it's really just the act of compressing your cover crop. So bending it down, uh, breaking it, 
Um, there are some cover crops like rye where if you just cut it, um, you can still, you know, you can put those uh, cuttings down and that will act like a mulch, but the rye will grow back. Um, it's, uh, I believe it's rhizomatous. So it just keeps on growing. Um, and potentially even if you pull it out, it, it could still grow back. Um, so what the best thing to do to prevent further growth uh, of the rye and to use it as green mulch is just to crimp it once kind of in the middle of the plant and then once farther down towards the base of the plant. Um, so this is, uh, that's good for planting into. Um, so as far as uh, once the season's over, uh, you, you wanna protect your soil for the next growing season. Uh, straw mulch is a really good um, item to use. Uh, it, it retains moisture, it, it insulates the soil. And so by doing that, it prevents heaving. Um, this is important for uh, shallow rooted uh, fruits and vegetables like strawberries um, stuff that has the capability to overwinter, but needs a helping hand. Um, yeah, so it keeps, it keeps a plant dormant that, um, maybe need a couple growing seasons to reach maturity. So for instance, we, we planted asparagus last year and, um, it probably would have, some of it would have survived if we hadn't straw mulched it, but because we did straw mulch it, uh, more of it is likely to survive. Um, and so winter mulching helps plants uh, conserve energy that they need, that they can then put into growing the following spring. Um, when you apply your straw mulch or any other kind of winter mulch, uh, it's, it's, it's very key. Timing is key with this. Um, if you apply it too early when the weather's still warm, there's a chance that you could uh, cause... Um, fungal growth, mold, um, it, 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 it can be more detrimental to the plants if you apply straw mulch too early. Um, conversely, if you take it off too late, uh, or excuse me, if you, it, yeah, if you take it off too early, you, you could cause uh, a cold shock to whatever plants you're trying to overwinter. So you wanna make sure that you're applying it um, at the right time and taking it off at the right time. And that will vary from, from crop to crop. So it's, it's best to uh, consult an agronomist or a horticulturalist or, uh, and just let them know what exactly you're planting and they should have some specific information regarding when to apply and when to take off. Uh, oops, excuse me. Um, so this was another video and all it was was just uh, me removing the straw from these are garlic plants. Um, and again, they, they probably would have, some of them would have done just fine without straw mulch, but putting straw mulch on definitely, uh, it's, it's like an insurance policy. Um, it'll, it, it helps you uh, ensure that more of the, the crop is gonna come through. Um, so I'm just kind of carefully taking off the straw here I started using a rake and while garlic is hardy, you know, I started to uh, kind of brush up against the garlic a little bit too much. And I thought a gentler approach is required. So depending on how closely you plant your crops um, also kind of determines how you lay your, your winter mulch out, how you take it off. Um, there's a lot of variations. Um, so crop rotation, um, something that you know is is maybe not thought of as much on for small scale scale gardening as it is for large commercial farms uh, but it has the same benefits so uh, why is it important to vary what you plant from year to year um, and a lot of this information I, I took out of crop rotation on organic farms which is a SARE publication and the 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 full name is escaping me right now. Um, sustainable agriculture resource something, I think. Um, but I, I, I posted a link in my references. And so if you, if you follow that link, it'll take you to this book and the website has just a plethora of, uh, different resources for soil health, um, crop harvest, anything you can think of. Um, 
it has a, it has a resource for that. Um, but this book, um, one of the, on one of the first pages, it talks about uh, why is it important to rotate your crops. Well, uh, it increases your potential to earn income, uh, which if you're a commercial grower is is very good. Um, it's it's what you're you're aiming for. Um, increases soil quality or, and and builds soil capital, and and soil capital is. It can best be defined as how productive soil is. Uh, soil building practices are an investment in long-term soil productivity. Uh, improved soil facilitates water infiltration, water holding, aeration, and ultimately root growth and plant nutrient foraging. So, I mean, it, it kind of, and in a way, I mean, cover crop planting and crop rotation are kind of the same thing. If you can incorporate cover crops into your crop rotation, and a lot of uh, commercial growers are doing that now uh, at a very large scale, um, but you get the same benefits in, in a garden, whether it's, whether, whether it's a raised garden or you know community garden plot, um, it's, you get the same kind of benefit. Um, Rotating crops also mitigate, mitigates a little bit against uh, pests. So if you have tomato hornworms um, or flea beetles, changing where you put your crops from year to year um, kind of keeps the, the pests on their toes. They have to search for the crop more. Um, and so it, it makes it a little more difficult. You, you'll still probably get some, and that's where... Um, pest management comes in, um, uh, applying a uh, non-toxic uh, pesticide, um, planting some wildflower mixes that invite predatory insects in that help you manage uh, those pests. That's, that's also important, um, but crop rotation definitely is a step in the right direction. And um, here, this is another video that unfortunately will not play. Um, what I'm doing here is I'm turning soil, um, first of all, raking off straw mulch, winter mulch, um, and then turning soil up and onto garden beds. Um, and this is, uh, I, did, I wasn't quite really sure where to put this slide, um, but it, it's, it's important even before you uh, broad fork your garden bed, uh, before you uh, you rake it, um, you want to you want to build up your soil bed uh, so that it's it's I would say maybe four to five inches uh, above your your walkways between your garden beds. Um, this prevents a couple of things. Uh, number one, if you have flooding issues, um, uh, it will definitely help uh, against mitigate that risk. Um, and number two. Um, you're putting, um, um, you're kind of in a very uh, cheap, non-technical way, kind of, in my mind, you're adding nutrients to the top of the soil. You're bringing nutrients from below the topsoil and kind of, and adding topsoil to the top of your garden bed. Um, it's, in, it's important that when you do this, you incorporate all the soil together, you broad fork it, and then you plant very quickly. Because if you just and it's really hard work, it's time intensive, but if you just sh shovel soil onto the top of your bed, let it sit and don't do anything with it. Uh, you know, at this time of the year, it could be fried by the sun. A lot of uh, important nutrients could be killed. Um, so you wanna make sure you're doing all these steps, ideally in the same day, uh, one right after the other. Um, and they don't necessarily all need to be done in the same same order, but. Uh, I would suggest, you know, adding soil to your garden bed first, broad forking, um, or incorporating with, with the shovel, then broad forking, and then um, planting your crop. So lastly, I'm just going to talk uh, briefly about compost. Um, there are a lot of different compost methods, at, at least a few. Um, I'm going to talk about three here, uh, and this picture was actually taken at the New York Street Garden um, on campus, and uh, this is this is kind of a, a typical compost setup uh, 
bend, rotating bend compost. Um, and the idea is that you put your garden scraps, um, anything that you've harvested that you can't use or that maybe didn't grow quite the way you want it to, uh, don't throw it away, compost it. Um, so you want to make sure that your barrel has an air hole. And usually I, I believe these come with um, a PVC pipe or some kind of opening where air is let in. Um, and so that helps with the compost process, helps uh, break the waste down. Um, you can add worms even to these kinds of um, 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 compost structures. Red, red wigglers are the kinds of worms you want to add in, um, and they will expedite the uh, composting process. What makes good compost? Uh, well, uh, varying the input uh, of your compost is, is number one. So you don't just want to put a bunch of orange peels or um, potato skins. Uh, you want to you want to add both of those in about equal quantities. You want to add some greens to it. Um, you want to add stuff that uh, so that it kind of looks like a rainbow. Um, at least at first, it'll turn brown, so it won't look very pretty um, after a while. But when you're adding your food scraps in, you want to have a variety. Um, yeah, and so damaged produce is, is something that can definitely be added. Um, you want the material to, uh, in most compost methods, to, to um, be, you want a little bit of airflow, but you don't want a whole lot, because the idea is that, that you're creating compost by building up heat, um, and that heat kind of uh, um, activates bacteria, and that, that's, that's what breaks the compost down. Um, so, uh, here I have, uh, kind of a diagram of a vermicomposting bin, um, which this is not the best diagram, but if you can imagine, um, worms kind of in the middle of the diagram, you're adding food scraps on top. Um, and then at the bottom you have kind of a little chamber, uh, where compost, uh, juice is made, which is, is also beneficial. Um, and when you add water and aerate that, then that creates compost juice, which can be sprayed on rather than applied by a shovel, which um, if you have a bad back, you, you, uh, you might want to consider using compost tea, creating compost tea instead of uh, shoveling loads of uh, solid compost onto your beds. Um, and so that vermicomposting is, is is a very uh, good system it's it's sometimes a little more expensive to create that kind of a system than a traditional compost bin or uh, like a like a compost stable you see sometimes um, and you you just want to make sure that that again with vermicomposting it's not so important to rotate the material because the worms are doing that process for you but with other compost systems um, bends and paddocks, uh, you want to make sure that you're, uh, you're agitating the compost from time to time. And so here, uh, the picture on the, on my left is actually of Hilltop Garden and Nature Center. Uh, and this gentleman's name is Andre. He, uh, I'm not sure if he still works there, but when I was interning at Hilltop, he, uh, was in charge of a number of things, one of which was building uh, the compost system they have now. And the way they, uh, I wish I had a, a bigger picture, more comprehensive picture of this because they actually have five or six compost paddocks. Um, it almost looks like a horse stable. Um, but so the first paddock, uh, you, you put the, the, the food scraps in there and then two or three weeks later, you move them to the second one, so on and so forth. So by the end of the, the, by the time you get to the fifth paddock, uh, you have compost that's ready to be applied to garden beds. And uh, here again, I just have another picture of uh, the compost beds at the New York Street Garden. And so uh, finally, uh, this is uh, the part that you can take home, incorporate into your own gardening practice. Um, so my suggestions are you really want to integrate cover crops into your garden plan, into a crop rotation for your garden. Um, oats and peas, uh, like I said, are a good um, um, 
cover crop mix to use are cheap uh, and expensive. Uh, they, they have a good germination rate usually. Um, we purchased uh, cover crop mix from Johnny's last year uh, and it did pretty well. Um, keeping a record of what was grown in your garden beds the previous year is important um, primarily for crop rotation because you want to, you don't, again, you don't want to be planting tomatoes in the same space year after year. You're going to deplete uh, your, your soil of nutrients. Um, and then finally, composting your, your food waste, uh, any kind of kitchen scraps, vegetable scraps, uh, fruit and vegetable skins, um, toilet paper rolls, uh, paper towel rolls, that cardboard, cardboard that doesn't have any kind of um, paint or gloss that's just kind of natural a cardboard you can add um, a little bit of that to your compost um, and with that here are the references i used um, yes purdue extension um, marion county swcd and then the crop rotation on organic farms the crop rotation on organic farms i believe you can get a free pdf of that um, that manual. So uh, the, the, the carbon copy costs, I think like 20 or $25, but I believe the PDF is free. Um, and the, the Purdue extension, um, I think at just about every major urban center in Indiana, there is a Purdue extension. I know there's one in Fort Wayne. Um, there's one in Indianapolis. Uh, there's one around Noblesville even, I think. Um, so they, they're kind of spread all over the state. Um, and again, I highly recommend checking out the Marion County Soil and Water Conservation District. They have a lot of free resources, uh, particularly regarding uh, rain gardens, um, cover crops, uh, soil health, uh, and storm water. So I definitely recommend you check them out. And here is my contact information, um, as well as the IEPUI Office of Sustainability's contact information. I, uh, I'm an intern there um, as a urban gardens manager. Um, and so I'll, I'll leave this slide up for a little bit. And with that, let me see if I can do this here. Um, does anyone have any questions? I have a question. Yes. You were talking about um, rye being good for stabilizing soil. Mm -hmm. Did you mean like it just keeps it from um, like blowing off from like losing soil or what, what did you mean by stabilizing? Yeah, a good question. Um, so I guess uh, the language I should have used was uh, erosion control. So because it's, its roots uh, grow so deeply, um, it's very good at preventing erosion. So, um, and I would, by extension, I would, I would think that would keep the soil from blowing away, so. Thanks. Any other questions? If you don't want to speak out loud, you're welcome to uh, type your question into the chat box. I have a question. Yes, Christina. Where would you recommend that folks buy compost? Is that something that they can find in the store or do they have to, you know, find a friend that does it? Right. Um, well, I would recommend that uh, everyone starts their own compost, but if that's not an option, if you live in an apartment um, that doesn't have an outside space, uh, there are businesses um, in Indianapolis, there's Green Cycle, I believe. Um, Bloomington, I know, has Green Camino compost. Um, it's worth doing a Google search just to see uh, if there are compost businesses um, in your city or area. Um, and sometimes you can find it at stores, although I think it's usually a soil mix with compost. I don't know if it's, I don't think it's usually just compost. So good question. Thank you.
Anything else? I will uh, put the contact informa information slide up just another minute longer. Oh, there's someone in the chat. Uh, just a little bit longer. Um, and just to make sure if you have any questions um, for me or for the IUPUI Office of Sustainability, you're welcome to um, contact, us, contact us through any of these uh, methods, ways. Um, and with that, I will go ahead and end the presentation. Thank you everyone for joining. Have a wonderful afternoon.